Good morning, everyone. Back home in Colorado, I think it's 1.30 a.m. So it is awfully early in the morning for me, but I'm so glad to see you all. Thank you for coming to my talk. And I want to thank the... I want to thank the organizers of Scala UA for having me out here. Actually, last year I did a remote presentation at a Scala UA meetup, I think it was, with Alexandra. And that was a lot of fun. And I got to meet some of the local Scala community here in Kiev. And ever since that happened, I thought, I've, I've got to make it to Scala UA one of, the, one of these years. And it just so happened to work out that this is the year. It fit into my schedule, and the organizers were on board with that, so I'm really excited to be here. Today, I'm going to be speaking about the topic of thinking functionally. This is a chance for me to take you and pull you into my world and let you experience what it's like to think about a big, complex, gnarly problem from the perspective of functional programming. And I hope in doing this exercise that you learn not just how functional programmers approach some of the everyday challenges that we run into when we're writing software, but also why. That is, I hope after, you're in, after you come out of this session at the end of today, that you come out with some insight into why it is people like me choose to solve the problems that they have using functional programming. Because you do have a choice. You can solve these problems in lots of ways. And, and I hope by the end of the session, you understand why some of us have chosen to make functional programming the way that we solve all the problems in our day-to-day -day business. Well, first, I'm going to dive into a little intro to effects. And I'll be specifically talking here about functional effects, because it would be easy for me to show you quick sorts and talk a little bit about pattern matching and recursion, but that's the easy stuff. That's functional programming in the small. And a lot of us have already done that. And a lot of people get stuck there, and they never graduate from functional programming in the small to functional programming in the large. They never understand how functional programming can apply to all their application, not just the fun little helper functions that operate on immutable data. So we're going to look at that. And then I'm going to give you a backstory. So I'm going to give you a little problem, hypothetical, but it could be realistic. This could be you. Two weeks from now, this could be you in your day job. And we'll, we'll see how that translates. And then I'm going to walk you through some live coding as we take a concurrent imperative application, and step by step, we refactor it into its functional equivalent. And we're going to solve some problems along the way. We're going to fix some bugs. We're also going to improve the code. And by comparing the before and after, you're going to get a feel for just what functional programming can do to a real world application. Effects. Why effects? Why am I starting with effects? Well, procedural effects are anything in your application that interacts with the real world. This could be printing statements to a log line or a log file. It could be reading data from a socket. It could be mutating memory. It could be calling a business API or making a change in a database. Procedural effects do things with the real world. They leave their mark on the real world. And procedural effects have this property that they're often encoded in side-affecting Scala functions which aren't total. They might blow up on you. They might never return. And they're not deterministic. Every time you, you do something, every time you call a database, for example, you might get back a different answer. These are the heart and soul of programming with procedural programming and object-oriented programming. If you build a business app using procedural programming or OOP, then you are building, it by and large, on a, a stack of procedural effects, a bunch of statements in your program doing one thing after another. Functional effects are a bit different. We still have the need to do the same types of things in our functional applications that we do in the world of OOP and procedural programs, but we do them in a different way. Instead of actually interacting with the real world, we build descriptions of interaction with the real world. These are nothing more than immutable data structures that describe what we want to do at some point in the future. The analogy you can use here is a procedural program will actually do things, whereas a functional program will merely describe the fact that it wants to do something later on. Procedural programs do stuff. 
Functional programs describe stuff as immutable values. That's the difference. Over on the left-hand side, you can see a procedural program that prints a line of text to the console. It is doing something. Over on the right-hand side, you can see a corresponding functional programming. And that doesn't do anything except build the data structure. In this case, it builds this data structure called task, which just has an unevaluated piece of code in there, what's called a thunk. Basically stores a pointer to a hunk of Scala code that, if you call it at some point in the future, will end up printing out that line of text to the console. So the procedural program over on the left-hand side does something. It interacts with the real world. The functional program on the right-hand side doesn't do anything except build a value, and that value merely describes the act of interacting with the real world, but doesn't actually do it. Functional programs, they build models. They build models that describe complex interaction with the real world. That's all they do. And at the end of the world, in your application's main function, yes, you have to run that model. That is, you have to translate that description of input-output operations into the corresponding procedural effects that it describes. But you don't have to do that until your main function. So you can end up building, operating in a purely functional way in the vast majority of your program. And then it's only at the edge where you actually have to translate that model of an effectful program into the procedural effects that it describes. That's where libraries like Zio come into play. So Zio is a very small, lightweight, zero dependency library that can help you do functional programming at the scale of applications. Zio helps you write applications that are concurrent, asynchronous, and parallel. It helps you solve some really tough problems in concurrency and asynchronous programming. And it also happens to be purely functional. So everything you see in Zio is purely functional. There's no doing in Zio, there's just describing. And then Zio, of course, contains these functions that allow you to interpret what is essentially a description, a model of your effectful program into the effects that it describes, and you call that that unsafe run function at the end of your world. The primary type in Zio is called Zio. And what this is, is it's a functional effect. That is to say, it's a description of a bunch of real world interaction. The Zio data type has three type parameters, and the meaning of these three type parameters is as follows. The R type parameter is the environment that is required by this effect. So in order to run this effect, you need to provide it an R. The E type parameter is the type of error of the effect. So when you run the effect, it might fail with some error value of type E. And the A value is the type of success of the effect. So when you run that effect, it may succeed with a value of type A. And if you're looking for a nice mental model of the Zio effect type, then you can think of it as an effectful version of the following function. It's a function from R to either an E or an A. So you feed this effectful function an R, that's what it requires. And either that's going to fail with an E, or it's going to succeed with an A. That's what a Zio effect is. You give it an R, and you get back either an E or an A. Now, of course, the Zio effect type models asynchronous effects and concurrent effects and other types of effects, resource effects. So it's actually not quite as simple as a basic function like that. But, but you can always simplify that a bit inside your head. When you're trying to develop an intuition for what a Zio effect is, you can always think of it in that simplified fashion as an effectful function that give it an R, and it'll give you back either an E or an A. Now, to deal with common cases, there are some type synonyms that you're going to see in the exercise I'm going to work on. And these are as follows. UIO, which stands for unexceptional IO, is a type synonym for the Zio data type. It plugs R or it plugs any into the R type slot. If you plug any into the R type slot, that means your effect doesn't require anything. If you have a function from any to either of EA, then you can feed that function anything you want, like unit or the number 42 or whatever, in order to get back that either. So when you plug any into that 
R type parameter slot, that indicates you have an effect that requires absolutely nothing because it can deal with anything. The UIO type alias plugs in nothing for the air type. And what nothing for the air type means is that it means it cannot produce an error. It cannot fail. This is an effect type that cannot fail. If you have a type in your Scala program, either nothing int, you know for a fact that that is right of an int because it cannot be left of nothing because there is no value in the Scala type system that has type nothing. There was never any way you could construct a value of left of type nothing. So you know it's a value of right of, of some int. Nothing basically indicates that something is missing. There's a hole there. And when you plug it into the E type parameter in the Z effect type, that indicates your effect cannot fail. So UIO of A is basically an effect that requires nothing, cannot err, and can succeed with a value of type A. Task, on the other hand, is an effect that doesn't require anything. It can fail with any value of type throwable, and it can, see, can see, succeed with a value of type A. This most closely approximates Scala's future, because we know a Scala future can fail with any throwable, or it can succeed with a value of the specified type. So if you're looking for a close analog of Scala's future, this is it. Task R is another type alias that says it requires some R. It can fail with any value of type throwable, and it can succeed with an A. And finally, IO of EA says it doesn't require anything, but it can fail with an E, fail with an A, or succeed with an A. So these are the four primary type aliases that you're going to find in the Zio library, and you'll see a few of them in the exercise that we're going to explore in a second here. But keep in mind, all of these are nothing more than type aliases. Zio only has one effect type, and that's the Zio effect type with the three type parameters. In a procedural program, we construct our program using effectful statements. Every statement does one thing. Over on the left-hand side, we have a program that prints out a line of text. It reads a line of text from the console, prints out your name back to you, mirrors out your name, and then returns unit. That's a basic procedural program. Every statement there does something. And the collection of statements embodied by program does a whole bunch of things. That's the only way in which statements compose. We can take two statements, and we can do one thing first, and then the other thing second. And of course, we can treat that as something that does a bunch of things. Statements compose sequentially. Over on the right-hand side, we're not dealing with statements anymore. We're dealing with Zio effect types, which are values. So we're not actually doing anything. We're taking values, and we're composing them together using operations like flat map and map to get back other values. And what we end up getting out of the right-hand side is just another value. It's another Zio, Zio effect. So if you call that in the console, if you call programming in the console, you'll end up just getting an ordinary value. It's an immutable value. And if you want anything to happen, if you want interaction with the real world to happen, then you're going to have to unsafely run that. And then that immutable value will be translated step by step into the series of operations that it describes. Notice the difference in syntax. On the left-hand side, we have uh, more statement-oriented way of describing a program. And on the right-hand side, we have a very value-oriented way of describing a program. We're actually building up our program using expressions and operators on expressions. So everything on the right-hand side is a value or an operator that's combining two values. And then on the left-hand side, it's a bunch of statements. Effect systems like Zio basically transform our effectful programs into pure values that we can pass around from function to function, that we can store in data structures, that we can return from functions. And this opens up a lot of possibility for increased expressivity inside our functional systems, as we'll see in a second here. All right, so here's the backstory. You're working on this really cool business application. And one of the features of this business applications is as the user is using it for a certain while, eventually it's going to prompt the user and say, hey, wouldn't you like to share this wonderful app with all your friends? 
And of course, companies put features like this in here because they want to use, they want to incorporate some virality into their software. They want it to propagate along a user's social network. Now, this is a very common feature to have inside an application. And so you end up building this invitation service that after the user has been using the application for a while, will invite the user's friends to give the application a try as a means of hopefully introducing new users to the wonderful, wonderful functionality provided by the application. The only problem is it's been a long time since you wrote that code. And a lot of people have been in that code base making changes. Requirements change and so forth. And now it's more than a little bit buggy. And, and your boss is screaming at you to fix these bugs and says, look, we've got people complaining about this problem and this problem and this problem, and we know it's all in this invitation service. You need to fix it. So you have two weeks. <laughs> you have two weeks to fix all the problems in this invitation service. What are you going to do? Well, let's take a look and see if functional programming can help you out. So here's the setup for the problem. You have a bunch of foreign code. This is written in a bunch of different libraries. So some of these are Java libraries, some of them are Scala libraries, and so forth. You don't have control over this code. This is what you have to work with. You've got this logging function that's used all over your application. You've got a login function to log in, given an auth token, it's going to give you the user ID if it succeeded. It's going to return a try here. You've got get profile, which is Given an ID, it's either going to call this success callback or call this failure callback after it tries to get the profile of the user and apparently doesn't return anything but unit. You have a get friends function that given the user ID and an implicit execution context will give you a future of a list of user ID. And then you have this send mail function which is apparently synchronous and given the from email address and the to email address and the subject in the message, we'll go ahead and try to send an email right now and presumably throw an exception if something bad happens. Then you have a few different data types. The only interesting one is the user profile, which contains a name and an email. So to get the email of a user, it's not sufficient to have the user ID. You need to actually retrieve the profile file of the user to figure out what their email address is. So here is the solution that you wrote way back when, six months ago or so, and that has been modified by many, many people since then. This is how it's structured. First off, it's structured in an object-oriented fashion. Here's your class here. This is the invitation service. And it has a bunch of methods related to inviting friends of the user to use the application. And it has some dependencies here. All these dependencies are bundled using the cake pattern, they're all bundled together into one object here called services. And what services is, is nothing more than a bundle of one, two, three, four services. So it has logging, social, auth, and email. Let's take a look at each of these services below. So the logging module contains the logging service. This contains a single field called logging, which points to the logging service. The logging service has a bunch of log-related methods. The only one we care about is the one listed here, which simply logs out this line of text. And then we have a production implementation, and presumably in your tests, maybe you have mock implementations or do-nothing implementations if you don't want to pollute the tests with useless logging crap. The authorization module contains the authorization service, which contains this login method. And you have a live implementation of this, which merely delegates to the third-party login code. The social module contains the social service, which contains a bundle of two different methods. One to get the profile of the given user ID, and it will send either the success to that callback or the failure to the other callback. And then another one which gets friends, and clearly you can see these are written in different styles. They probably use different libraries to provide their functionality. This one's written in the future style. This is written in the callback style. This is probably some Java API. This is probably some Scalified API. And then we have the live implementation of this social service, which merely delegates to this third-party code. 
Then we have the email module, which contains the email service, which contains the send email function. And then finally, we have the live implementation of this module that will go ahead and, and send the email using the functionality provided by Common. So those are the services that our application is working with. That's all we have to implement our functionality. Now, it's been a while since you wrote this code, so you dig into it and you try to understand what's going on. Well, first off, you're given this. You're given that we have some problems with this method. First off, two thread pools are becoming exhausted. So they're running out of threads. Maybe we're getting submission rejected exceptions somewhere, or maybe someone fired this up in JProfiler and they found out that two of our thread pools are running out of threads. This is not good. Also, we know that sometimes errors are not being reported. Errors are happening somewhere deep down inside this service, and they're disappearing. They're not being reported. They're not being lost in log files. We only know about them because we, we recognize that some things fail, and we, we didn't know that they failed. We figured that out, and we, we couldn't find anything in the log files that would lead us on the right track. And then finally, the social and email services are being randomly overloaded with requests. This is a non-deterministic problem, but sometimes the social services will just go bananas because we're hitting them so many times. And it's unexpected to us because not a lot of users are using an application, our application. It's a cool application, but it's not a very popular application, not yet. And then the email server sometimes goes down because it's just randomly, seemingly randomly, hit with a ton of requests at the same time. Um, so these are the problems that we'd really like to fix. And meanwhile, the product manager is saying, while you're in that code, could you do one more thing for me, please? <laughs> I'm sure it will be easy, he says. He says, I'd love you to work around the flaky get friends method. So sometimes when this get friends method returns, it, it, it fails for a non-deterministic reason. Like it's probably backed by some Redis cache. And, and the data's not there. And while it's refreshing it, it just says, I can't help you right now. Try again later. So let's see if we can deal with all of this. But first, before we do, let's just figure out what the existing function does, see if we can understand it. All right, so the first thing it does is it calls the login method, and it gets back a try here, a try of the user profile. It creates a promise. Why does it create a promise? Well, we'll find out later, hopefully. It's creating a counter, and this is an atomic integer. So clearly when we wrote this code, we must have been thinking there's going to be multiple threads here. That's what we know so far. And it's not terrible code. At least we're doing this and not like var here. So we somewhat knew what we were doing. So however many months ago. And then we, we match against this user ID, which is a try. And either it's going to be a failure, in which case it looks like we log it and then throw it. Or it's a success, in which case we're going to do other stuff with it. So right here, you can see this is kind of an anti-pattern. It's not too bad, but we're logging something and then we're throwing it. Why do people log things that they then throw? It's because they're afraid. They're afraid this error will be lost because they don't know if it's going to be handled higher up in the application. And that makes sense, right? <laughs> you never know if someone's going to catch your exception. It's, it's common anti-pattern in procedural programming. You log something and then you throw it or you log it and, and so forth because you don't want to lose an exception. You'll see when we transform this into the functional version, we don't need to worry about that anymore because we're going to put the error into the type of the return value. So no one is going to be able to use the result of our function without handling the error. So we'll just push the problem up higher and they can log higher if they want or not as they see fit. But it'll give us the confidence we need to safely eliminate this useless logging down here at the bottom of our application. If it was a success, then here's what we do. We get the profile of this user ID, and it's going to, we have to provide two callbacks, the success callback and the failure callback. So in the success callback, we're going to do one thing, and in the failure callback, it looks like we're going to throw. Okay, so that will be thrown from, from whatever code calls that throw callback. Does that make sense? So this is, this is asynchronous here. 
So when we call get profile, it will at some point later call our success call back here or call our throw call back here. So already you can see there's something a little funky happening here. We're throwing an exception from a callback. That's not, that exception will not be thrown on the thread that is invoking the get profile function. It'll be thrown on whatever thread is calling the error callback. And who knows what's going to happen to that error? Who knows? It could be lost in the black hole. Or maybe whoever's calling that callback will be nice enough to log it somewhere. But that's already problem number one that we can see. All right, so we get the profile. If we actually do get it, if our success callback is called, then we get the friends of that user, and that returns us a future, a future of a list. So we're going to for each over that future, which means that if this future had nothing in it, that for each will not be invoked. So here's another possible place where we can lose an error, because if that future failed, then for each is, is not going to do anything with that. The for each will only be called if the future actually was completed with a successful result. So this is another place we can lose errors. If, on the other hand, that future was completed with a list of friends, then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, loop over this list of friends, and for each friend, we're going to do everything in here. OK, and, and we're stuffing all this code inside a future. Keep in mind the semantics of future. When you use the future constructor, it'll kick off that job right away. It'll start running right away. So this for each loop will complete really fast because it's just create, kicking off a bunch of futures that are running in parallel. So what we're doing is we're doing all this stuff in parallel. Everything you see inside here will be done in parallel up to the limit of the execution context passed into this method, because that's where these futures are running. They're running on that execution context. So inside these futures, what happens? Well, we count, we increment this counter, and if it's equal to the number of friends, then that means this is the very last iteration, it's the very last friends that we're iterating through, and so we complete the promise with a successful unit. Just keep that in the back of your mind. And then, and then what we do is we get the profile of the friend, and given the friend profile, what we're going to do is we're going to send an email from the user to the friend with this message inviting them to use our application. And since this profile thing might fail, we're going to ignore the error. We're not going to even even going to try to throw anything or whatever, whatever we're doing down here, we're not going to do it here. This is just sort of silently ignoring whatever happens with um, the failure to get the profile of the friend, because that can't, that can't hold up our application. Just because we failed to get the profile of one of the friends, that can't stop the application, or it shouldn't interfere with our attempting to do this with all the other friends that the user has. And then here, uh, this send email thing, it might throw an exception. So this can fail too. And if this fails, it will uh, throw an exception in this callback, in the success callback of get profile. And I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen to that error? Because we're not actually calling that callback. That callback is being called by get profile. So it, it may be doing something with that error. It may not. And then finally, at the end of the day, this promise that we created early on is going to be awaited on for up to 60 seconds. And then it's going to return the value of the counter. So this counter tracks the number of emails it, it sent, the number of friend emails it sent. So that's what's going to be returned here. The promise will be awaited on until basically all of these emails have been sent. So if there are 10 friends, then the counter will go from 0 all the way up to 10. And then after it reaches 10, it'll complete the promise with a success. And then that's when this thing here will resume there or 60 seconds, whichever one happens first. All right, does that make sense? Does the logic of that make sense? It's kind of, it's kind of a little strained. The logic inside here is a little strained. 
It looks like it's been through a number of iterations and people kept on adding stuff and like they didn't take the time to figure out how to make it exactly fit together correctly. But they have something that sometimes works, which is honestly what a lot of the code we deal with is like, like our code sometimes works. And, and this is far from the best code that I've ever seen in the wild. And it's also far from the worst code that I've ever seen in the wild. It's kind of like middle of the road, like it's doing some questionable things, um, but not so many questionable things that it makes me want to quit tomorrow, <laughs> resign today. <laughs> All right, so can we explain at a high level, can we explain some of the things that are going on here? Well, two thread pools are becoming exhausted non-deterministically. Two thread pools. Two thread pools. Think about that. Why two thread pools? Well, we have these futures here. And those are going to require an execution context. So this is going to execute on the EC that, that we have been given as an implicit here. But all this code inside here is going to execute on the thread that calls it, which may be a different thread pool. In fact, it will most likely be the HTTP request thread pool from whatever framework we're using. So there's actually two thread pools here. It may not seem like it, but there's two thread pools. There's the thread pool that's executing the invite friends logic and importantly, waiting on the result of this promise. And then there's the thread pool that occurs inside here as we do all this future stuff here in a loop, spitting those off. So we know that in some cases, we're exhausting both of these thread pools. Why is that the case? Well, look at this friends for each. What happens if a user has 10,000 friends or 100,000 friends? It could happen. <laughs> I don't have that many friends, but some people do. 100,000 friends in parallel. So that kicks off 100,000 of these and we're getting 100,000 profiles and we're also sending 100,000 emails in parallel that could easily lead to thread starvation, depending on how that execution context was set up. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is, what if a lot of these end up waiting for a really long time? In that case, whatever thread pool that this function is being called from could end up being exhausted. And, and that could happen quite easily because, well, we've got some bugs here. I mean, <laughs> we've got bugs that make the problem worse. First off, this increment in get, it will only set the promise if, if um, every single one of these things ends up succeeding. Um, it'll complete the promise. So th this could end up waiting for quite some time. Who knows how long? And the timeout, might, the timeout might happen first. So we could end up exhausting threads just by sitting around waiting for stuff to happen. So we've got several problems here that we can explain the exhaustion of both thread pools. Errors happen in the service don't always make it higher. So I think we've seen that. We've seen that there are a number of places where we will lose exceptions. In particular, this throw down here, it may seem like we're gonna get that exception and it will propagate upwards, but no, that's gonna be called by the get profile function, it's a callback. And who knows where that exception is going to end up. It certainly won't end up as a return value of get profile because get profile returns right away. So who, who knows? That could be lost. It could not be lost. And obviously, this one is very clearly lost. And, um, and there, could, there could be some other ones that are lost as well. The social and email services are randomly overloaded with requests, and we kind of know why that happens as well. It's because we're doing all of these in parallel regardless of how many friends the user has. If the user has 100,000 friends, we will fire off 100,000 concurrent requests, and that is going to lead to big trouble. The email service is probably not going to be able to handle that. The social service is not going to be able to handle that. It's too much parallelism, and there's no really clear way of fixing that. So we could go in here and we could hack solutions to these problems. It's not beyond our capability to go in here and make a bad function worse. We can always do that. But we're gonna take a step back and say, no, this function is becoming unreasonable. 
It has too much complexity for us to easily understand. And the changes that our boss has asked us to make are not going to be easy to make this to this function in a safe way. So we're going to take a step back and say, maybe, maybe we're going to use this as an opportunity to introduce a more functional architecture into our code base. And that will probably solve some of the problems by itself. The ones that it doesn't solve are going to be very, very easy to fix. So where is the complexity of this coming from? Part of it is the fact that all of this stuff, every single method here, some of these methods have multiple error channels. So this one can throw an exception, this one could throw an exception, or it could return a, a failure or a success. This one can throw an exception, or it could call the on failure callback. We have lots of error channels in our code base. And this happens a lot in real world applications. You have multiple error channels. That's a, always a bad idea. I highly recommend that you squash all error channels down to one to make reasoning about the error behavior of your application simpler. Eliminate all the other ones, just one error channel. That's all you need. Also, we're, we are mixing computational models here. This is a synchronous function. This is a synchronous function. This is a callback function. This is a future function. We're mixing totally different computational models. And that makes it really hard to reason about that code. And that's where functional effect types like Zio can help you because you can take all of these disparate computational models and you can lift them up into the same unified model of computation. You don't have to treat them differently. We'll see how to do that here in a second. And then the, the fact that we have to manually propagate errors through different computational models if we, if we want to avoid losing them, is super painful. So if we wanted to take and make this function lose no errors, then we would have to manually propagate errors from the callback style to the future style, from the future style to the synchronous style, and so forth. At every single system boundary, every boundary of a different computational mode, we would have to translate the errors from the old model into the new model. We're using three different models here, so that's a lot of translation. It's too much, and we don't have the time to do that as we're writing code. So we don't do it, and this is what happens. We end up with applications that are lossy in how they deal with errors, and people are afraid of losing them, so they start logging them, and then you just make a big mess bigger. Instead of addressing the root cause of the problem, you just make a big mess bigger. So let's see if we can clean this up. All right, so what I've done, just to simplify this, is I've ported all this code over. So we're, we're going to have the exact same pattern here. We're going to have a logging module. We're going to have an auth module. We're going to have a social module, um, and so forth. The only change that's going to be different in our services is that they're going to return functional effects. They're not going to do things. They're going to describe things. And that means we have to implement a few different functions here by basically taking the non-functional stuff that we have in common and wrapping it up into a nice, tidy, little functional effect. And in this process, you're going to see how we can take totally different computational models, future and callback and synchronous, and unify them into a single model of computation, which is the most powerful, compelling benefits of a functional effect system. So let's see how we do that with login. So here we're going to do common.login with the token, and we get back a try. So we will call task.fromTry to pull that try into task. Done, okay. The try went away. Now we're dealing with just a task of user ID. And keep in mind task is nothing more than a type synonym for a Zio effect type with certain type parameter for R and NE. Done. How about get profile? So get profile was the nasty one that required us to supply callbacks. We had to supply a success callback and a failure callback. Let's see how we can wrap that up into something nice and pretty. We call effect async for throwable error type and user profile will be our success type. And then we're given a callback inside here. And what we have to do is we have to call common 
get profile ID. And if we get an error, we're going to call the callback with task.fail of that error. And if we get a success, we're going to call the callback with task.succeed of that value. Oops, it looks like I reversed the order of these. OK, so now we've taken this nasty callback-based API, and we've turned it into a beautiful task of user profile. We've taken asynchronous model of computation and unified it into this. And same for get friends. So get friends return to future here. We'll just call zeo dot from future. We're given the implicit execution context. We will call common dot get friends with ID. And now we've taken the future model of computation and we've pulled it up into task. So we're unifying all, all these totally different models of computation have become unified. And all errors are now managed by zeo. Error propagation, all that stuff is man managed by Zia. We don't have to worry about translating errors between the different subsystem boundaries. And then we have one more, this send email one. We're going to use this blocking interruptible combinator to call common send email from to subject message. And now what we've done by using this interruptible combinator is we've taken this blocking call, synchronous blocking call, and we've lifted it up into Zio in such a way that Zio can now interrupt it safely, if necessary, if it determines that computation is not needed, or if we want to time something out. We, we don't want a, a thread to just hang on sending email forever. We want to be able to kill that thread. And Zio can do that automatically for us, as long as we import that using this interruptible combinator. So now, in our remaining three minutes, let's go ahead and see if we can implement invite friends. It should be simple. First thing we're going to do is we're no longer going to be doing things in a statement-oriented way. We're going to be composing values using operators. So we're going to be using a for comprehension here. So what we're going to start out doing is calling the auth services uh, login on the token. And then after we do that, we'll get the profile using the social service. And after we get the profile, then we're going to get the friends using the social service again. After we get the friends, what we're going to do is we're going to build up something I'm going to call uh, receipt, receipts. We're going to call this function called zeo for each. And we're going to iterate over all this list of friend IDs. And for each friend ID, we're going to do something. First, we have to get the profile of the friend. And then we have to send that friend an email. So rather than write that, I'm just going to copy paste it from this one here. So we send that friend an email. And then I'm going to yield unit here. But what I want to do is, if this fails for any reason, I want to keep track of that. And I'm going to use this receipt data structure that I wrote down here to keep track of that. So this receipt is basically nothing more than a map between user ID and either a success, which is none, or a failure, which is a sum of a throwable. And I have written these helper functions, success and failure, to construct a receipt. This is going to allow us to keep track of whether or not each one of these things is failing. So I'll just fold over this. And if I get some error, I'll do a receipt failure with the friend ID and throwable. Otherwise, I'll do a receipt success with the friend ID. And then 
uh, I'm going to take out of this receipts, so this is a list of receipts, I'm going to fold over this using receipt empty, and then I'm going to use this combination function to combine these two receipts into a single receipt, and I'm done. And in this single change, I've solved nearly every single problem with the original function. I just have two more things to do. First off, I'm using for each here, which means this is going to be done in uh, sequentially, not in parallel. So to fix that problem, I'm going to use for each par, but I don't want unlimited, parallel unlimited parallelism. That was one of the problems with the previous one. It just spun up unlimited numbers of features. So I'm going to constrain this to be 10, to be 10, parallelism limited to 10, using for each par n. So now I'm fixing the parallelism to a level of 10, and I'm losslessly capturing 100% of the errors. So I fixed every single problem with the original implementation, except I failed to do, I failed to do the bonus. <laughs> but this one, we're no longer blocking on future await, so we're no longer exhausting the primary th thread pool that is being used to invoke invite friends from the HTTP server that's handling the requests. And also, we're limiting the number of threads that we're using inside the dispatching emails, so we're not going to exhaust that thread pool either. So in, in summary, we've managed to fix all the original problems of this procedural one. We fixed thread exhaustion. We've managed to propagate all the errors. We're not losing any errors because Zio is doing that for us. We've unified all the different computational models, and errors are being propagated for us automatically. And we're no longer overloading the social or email services because we're limiting the amount of parallelism in the problem. And we did it in fewer lines of code with a much more declarative solution. And if you want to solve the remaining bonus problem, it's a one-liner right here. You just add dot retry here, and you specify some sort of reschedule. So I hope this provides a, I'm sorry I'm out of time. I, I went too slowly, apparently. But I hope this provides a good introduction to, to both how you can attempt solving a problem like this, a real world problem. This is a problem that many of you have run into, problems like this one, using functional programming. And, and not just how to do that, but also why. Like, why would you want to use a functional effect system? It's not just about reasoning. It's about solving problems, solving bugs in your code, making it easier to surface errors, writing better code, making it easier to more safely change your code in response to changing business requirements. So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to check out this repository and try your own hand at this problem. This is a really interesting problem, and it can teach you a lot about how to think about your problems in a functional way. Thank you so much for coming here. Hi, uh, my name is Vladimir. Uh, Touch question. Uh, do you have some techniques for feature flagging in your code, some functional style? Feature yes, feature toggle. Yeah, so feature flagging is an excellent question. I think that um, you, you can do feature flagging using Zio in any new environment. So for example, so, so you can do feature flagging using its Zio environment. Basically what you do is um, you have a, a feature service that contains a bunch of flags, and then you can access that service using Zio environment. You can access those feature flags from anywhere in your application. And that allows you to say, okay, if this feature is turned on, we're gonna do this, otherwise we're gonna do that. Basically, Zio environment, it provides you a baked in reader monad. Reader monads lets you propagate information automatically across your entire application, or, or across portions, domains of your application. So it makes it an easy way to do things like localization, feature flags, and things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other Hi, questions? Jones. Hey. Thank you for a great presentation. And I have one question to your yeah. talk. Like, you have this uh, for each par n function. Yeah. And uh, does this limit the concurrent right. computation only for a single invocation of invite friends or for all of them? Like, because like, I can have multiple invocations of invite friends uh, running concurrently. 
That's right. It only does it for a single in invocation. And what so if I will, because I can imagine that uh, I would like to limit it for all of the invocations because I know the limit of the of the, for example, get friends. So right. So that's actually easier. It's easier to do it that way than it is this way. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do global limits about how many people can be sending email at a single time inside your application, how you would do that is in the implementation of the service. You would use a ZO semaphore. And semaphores you can configure with a certain number of permits. For example, 100 permits. And then there's a with permit method on there that you can use to do an effect with a permit. So then you send email, you do with permit send email, common.send email, and now ensures that common.send email cannot be invoked until a permit is available. So that code will basically suspend until a permit's available. That allows you to apply system wide rationing on the total number of things that can be invoking the email service at a given time. And that is correct. For many applications, you want global lock on the number of things. For some applications, it's, it's per user. Like per user who's interacting with our application, we don't want them to use more than n level of concurrency. But in other cases, especially when you're dealing with foreign systems that you can't scale up and down, uh, a system global level uh, ration is more appropriate. Yes, I could. All right, thank you. Oh, uh.